Sam Cedar, Emma Viglin on the Majority Report. Uh, joining us now, Drew McHale. He is a scholar at the Center for the Study of Ethnic Conflict at Queens University, Belfast. Uh, frequent guest on uh, on TMBS. Um, I know that Michael first reached out to you. What, what, was it you reached out to him on Twitter or he reached out and uh, you reached out to him? Tell us why. Yes. Like, what was it about Michael that you thought like, oh, OK, I can uh, this is and we should say, obviously, you're you're a professor uh, and you, you, you work in conflict resolution. What was it about um, uh, Michael that uh, you, you thought was worth connecting with? Well, I'll give a shout out to my brother here because he's the one who turned me on to your show initially. So it wasn't the MBS first. It was the majority report. And he suggested, knowing that I'm not a great listener or watcher of podcasts, that, look, there's a really smart guy who's giving great commentary in the Middle East. Normally, this would be enough to turn me off. But um, I took a <laughs> listen. And obviously, all you guys are great um, for a start. Um, but particularly Michael's expertise in, in presenting a non-Orientalist view of American foreign policy in the Middle East. Obviously, he spent time there in Turkey, but more than that, and again, credit to your show, is the humor, right? Because I think that oftentimes that we work in very serious environments, at least I know I do, and a bit of humor and levity is really, really important for my day job. So um, hearing the impressions, uh, particularly the critique of Sam Harris, who at that point I was working a lot with de-radicalization work and um, in 2014 to 2016, there was a lot of work on the Muslim problem with Daesh or, or ISIS in the Middle East and hearing some pushback in the American mainstream media or the, the leftist media was really, really important. So I reached out to him and sent him a couple of articles that I had uh, written based on my research and one that, that I wrote with a, a co-author in the Washington Post about how radicalization happens. At that point, he spun on in conversation and then eventually meeting up and becoming friends. Um, and, and we should say, like, 2014, 2015 was like Sam Harris's uh, Islam is the mother load of, of bad ideas uh, era. Um, yeah. And, uh, and of course, you know, Michael w went on to, to, to write a book about the IDW, which was sort of the... The, the construction of what Sam Harris was sort of doing was sort of very similar, um, sort of like providing some type of intellectual cover for really sort of just reactionary um, uh, and some of the oldest sort of bigotry and prejudice and, and, and uh, I guess, um, uh, salutations to the hierarchy that you could uh, that you could find. But it was all repackaged. But um, let let's talk about that and particularly in the context of of cosmopolitan socialism we haven't talked about that but that to the extent that you know one can speculate as to where michael was going and and sort of mm -hmm. from where he was like he had what was really invested in this idea and it's not you don't really hear it referenced you don't hear the words cosmopolitan socialism thrown around that often uh, unless sometimes it's like a, uh, you know, an attack uh, on some level uh, or used as, mm -hmm. a, as an attack. What, what, e explain mm -hmm. to us your understanding of, of, of what cosmopolitan socialism is and, and sort of Michael's idea of it. Well, I'll jump on. I, I, I just want to reference one thing that you said about the Harris critique. The fact is one thing that stands above all is that it's intellectually boring and ill-read and poorly constructed, a historical, um, a sociological. And I think that this was the, the, the kernel from certainly my interactions with Michael, and he had a lot of better, greater minds influencing him and talking to him on the regular basis. But <clears throat> my influence or my conversations with him were very much centered around pushing back that or looking for integration, <clears throat> as it were, looking to sort of understand the composite whole um, of different systems that we want to critique and replace, um, different people who manifest or represent those systems, as you just said, who repackage themselves into American foreign policy or, 
or construction of power overseas, and to really provide not only a critique, but a viable alternative for understanding the world, for engaging with it, for seeing the problems rooted not only in our own societies, and this is where the cosmopolitan element for me comes in, seeing the problems of homelessness or the problems of uh, destitution or the problems of a failed capitalist economy in the US, seeing how they manifest elsewhere. Um, and particularly in October 2019, I, I sent Michael a couple of videos on WhatsApp in the middle of the Thaura protest in Lebanon, which was as, as close to um, a metaphor for late stage capitalism as I can think of, the worst economic collapse of the last 150 years, according to the World Bank. I said, look, this is actually in a state that is divided, that has historically been divided along ethno-religious lines. We had a great coming together in October 2019. And this sort of represents that sort of that hope of cosmopolitanism reaching beyond um, petty differences or instrumentalized differences of historical uh, violent division and actually setting us on a path of, 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 quite frankly, economic social justice as well. And I think that with Michael's early forays into writing, because we know that he was an excellent public speaker, he was excellent at engaging with the work on an auditory level. I think that, you know, it's the next step was really trying to crystallize some of those ideas on the page. Something that another scholar or another uh, polemicist could take in another part of the world and really run with some of those ideas for their own context to hopefully draw together a, a wider, more unitary direction for, of travel for left-wing left -wing politics. I, I, that that idea of of inter, uh, instrumentalized uh, divisions, I think, is one that is really mm -hmm. interesting. We, will you tease that out for us a little bit? Insofar as like, it doesn't mean that these differences aren't real. It's just that there are mm -hmm. multiple different approaches society can take to differences, um, and uh, in 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 some very. It, it, it's just a question of who gets there first, I guess, and what's right. in their best interests. Will, will you just tease that right. out for us? Yeah, and I will apologize for any overly academic language that I might use. I'll try to temper it as best as possible. But in the majority of cases that I work, uh, Great Lakes, East Africa, across the Middle East, uh, particularly Iraq, Lebanon, um, Burundi, I work in states that have suffered quite a lot of what we would call ethnic conflict, right? For the lack of a better term, it's not always ethnic. It could be religious, could be class. Um, and in the post years of, of the, the secession of violence, you see the same elites most often represented who were a uh, part of the, the warring class or who are leaders in, in violence, continuing to move up into political position. And these elites, and when I say instrumentalized, often create their own constituencies around whatever ethnic, we'll use for the shorthand, ethnic borders or ethnic uh, groups that they have. So they can, they can secure their own position in, um, in, the, in, the, in the fauna of the, of the polity, right? They want to maintain their position, a uh, privileged position, where they can get access to resource, access to wealth. They can... Uh, continue to lead their own ethnic constituency many, ge many generations down the line. And you don't need to go to East Africa and, and the Middle East to see it. You can see it in Northern Ireland as well. You can see it in, in post-conflict states in the global economic North. And the way that you replicate this power is by instrumentalizing and fostering those ethnic differences, those differences that people may have, as you said, rightly have a kernel in, of truth and difference in the political and social uh, outlook of certain groups. Um, I mean, sorry to use the crude terms, but like we can say Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland see how the state of Northern Ireland differently. There's a genuine concern and legitimacy on both sides of that argument. Um, but what the ethnic elites do is try to foster those divisions as much as possible to keep the options, the political options, as narrow as possible so the divisions remain salient. 
And in that saliency, they can continue to use the state apparatus to create clientelistic networks, to embed their own power, and to secure um, their own political futures to the detriment of the overall political program of the state and continuing divisions in them. And you see this repeated throughout. How much of that paradigm is uh, applicable, at least in terms of like the dynamics that you're talking about, to something like anything from, I don't know, January 6th Mm -hmm. uh, in this country, or I mean, Jim Crow in in the wake of, of the Civil War, um, I mean, it, 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 it seems like that dynamic or even in the context of, I, I just, you know, uh, in the wake of nine 11 and to, to compare and contrast, like what George W. Bush was doing, I had just happened to go to Cuba and watching like the way the Castro was, I just remember a, a statue of, uh, of, um, uh, shoot, I can't remember, uh, who it was. There's a statue out in front of the, uh, the U S annex where, um, I can't remember his name, but he was a, 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 uh, like one of the founding fathers of, of Cuba holding Elion and Gonzalez, obviously time and space, but the idea of creating outside nationalism on some level functioning in the same way that ethnicity or race or whatnot, uh, religion can function. How much of that, 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 uh, paradigm is applicable to these different areas? A hundred percent applicable. Um, and I've discussed this with other scholars of, of U.S. politics who uh, there's quite a um, I get quite uneasy because oftentimes a lot of the states and I in which I work have been characterized in the literature as deeply divided. Right. And I think that, you know, again, scooting over the crudeness of that term, who's to say that there, we the increased division within U.S. politics doesn't start to resemble a deeply divided society? Right. We can draw those lines across different regions. Again, I'm not an expert in the U.S., so I'm not I'll leave that to you. But um, certainly in the conversations that I've had that you can see the instrumentalization, um, the, the drawing of hardened, crystallized boundaries over what it means to be a member of the U.S. state. Right. And this doesn't have to be along ethnic terms, although I think that if we were to look at the nationalistic fervor and discourse created in the U.S., around January 6th and ethnic racial differences, we'd probably see a Venn diagram that would, you know, that would right. probably align yes. in a lot of different yes. ways. Yes. So, <clears throat> so, there, <clears throat> so historically, obviously we've seen, as you, as you've mentioned, the Jim Crow era, we've seen civil rights, we've seen a, a large, you know, longitudinal movement within the US that has created a state that that looks that is eager to include certain individuals but not others and oftentimes when we see instrumentalization by political elites they harken back to those golden era moments of of when the state was great or the problem with the state now is that we've let other people in and it was much simpler and much easier whenever we were able to fully control the different functions so yes there are um, tremendous overlaps because the reality is is that these these types of tactics aren't greatly original and they're not greatly varied. So you do see the repeating of them uh, ac- across time and space and boundaries as well. They're not they're not not temporally or borderly locked. Um, and unfortunately, you do see the the outcrop of what happens whenever a leader decides to instead of creating a unified paradigm, they create a narrow one, and then you start to see increased division and polarization. Um, I, I want to ask, I mean, I, I, I have a sense and I think maybe our audience does at this point too, but what do you think that Michael was most interested about you, about, about your work? I mean, and, 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 and to what extent did he, um, want a, um, uh, a solution <laughs> to that, like how you address that instrument, uh, instrumentalization of these differences? Mm-hmm. Um, obviously it wouldn't shock your audience to say that, um, Michael saw things through a largely class perspective, right? There's, there's a Marxist reading throughout all of, Mar- all of uh, Michael's work, which, um, 
which doesn't appear in much of my academic work. Um, so people would be shocked to say, well, well, why does he talk to him? And in many levels, I would be shocked as well. But Michael showed great support and great friendship for for pushing the, the narrative of my work um, when oftentimes that I wouldn't have it either. So, I mean, throughout those times, he was very supportive. So I think that, you know, I always be grateful and have gratitude for his friendship for actually getting me over the large amount of imposter syndrome that that appeared with early academics. But I think that we had, um, certainly there was an, a historic and sociological reading to how people exit from violence. So a lot of my, my expertise or my supposed expertise is around violence to peace transitions. How supposedly, and again, going back to the kernel of why um, Michael and I hit it off so so quickly was this sort of ahistorical, asociological, apolitical reading of, well, Sunnis just hate Shias in Iraq and there's no way we could have predicted what happened to Iraq, right? Um, is quite fundamentally BS. Um, what I've what I look at in my work is showing how these transitions are malleable. How if you reduce instrumentalization from political elites, and there are economic programs, political programs, good leadership, you often see these insurmountable or primordial divisions start to disappear. It's incredibly difficult, obviously, because these elites remain in power, and there are also regional and international interests in places like Iraq that potentially have um, maybe not a willingness to see division, but, on, well, certainly maybe in the regional context versus Iran versus Saudi's impact in Iraq, but internationally, not everyone is always playing the game of, of division, but it's still, they can bumble their way into making a lot of mistakes. However, what I've seen in every grassroots community, whether it's a Democratic Republic of Congo, whether it's Burundi, whether it's Northern Ireland or Lebanon or Iraq, at grassroots levels, communities that have been considered by outside um, actors and outside um, thought leaders and policy leaders as completely insurmountable often come together and cooperate, in cooperation. So I think that Michael's interest in my work fundamentally was how do we create um, or scale up some of that co collaboration and cooperation that can get over decades worth in some cases of violence to actually move towards a political program.